Hello and welcome to Fermentation Training Camp. This was a week-long deep dive and hands-on training in coffee processing, focusing on washed coffees with a yeast-inoculated fermentation. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry, I'll explain as we go. I'm Kat Melheim, or Roaster Cat, and I'm your host and guide on this fermentation journey. I attended Lucia's workshop in January of 2023, and this is the video about that. So Lucia Solis is the brains behind this camp. She is a winemaker turned coffee processing specialist, and if you don't listen to her podcast, Making Coffee with Lucia yet, get to it. She has so many episodes with invaluable information all about coffee, processing, microbial activity, everything you didn't know you didn't know about coffee fermentation. In this video, I'll take you along with me through the entire fermentation process so you can see it all. We will receive the coffee, assess it, clean it up a bit, and pulp it. Then we have three fermentation methods to choose from yeast inoculated, citric process, and lactic process. In this video, I'll go start to finish through the yeast inoculated process since that's how we processed a majority of our coffee. And I'll be releasing videos of the citric process and the lactic process in the coming weeks, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss those. And I'm gonna cut in right here with a little note from the editing room. These videos are meant to be descriptive of what we did, not prescriptive or used as a guide. There was way more than I can accurately convey on a short YouTube video. So if you wanna learn these processes and implement them, I recommend that you take Lucia's fermentation training camp workshop. But with that note, let's get back to it. After we received the coffee, we submerged the whole cherries in a tank of water. This was primarily to cool the cherries down to halt any fermentation we didn't want to happen yet. These coffee cherries have been in bags out in the sun all day, getting hotter and hotter. And you know what happens to fruit when it sits in the hot sun? It spoils. So we want to bring the temperature down as much as possible, as quickly as possible. Submerging the cherries in water also allows us to do a primary float. This literally means that we remove the coffee cherries that float on the water. Ripe coffee cherries sink because of their higher density, whereas cherries with defective seeds, insect damage, or unripe cherries will float. Hey Lucia, should you do this floating step for all coffee fermentations? So just to be clear, this method is for the yeast. <laughs> so this is not the best method for all coffee everywhere all of the time. This is just the best practices for inoculated, obviously natural to stay out the whole time. <laughs> Obviously, um, other methods purposely leave the cherries in bags, sealed, to get hot. That is perfectly okay for those methods. Once the coffee has cooled in the water and we've skimmed off the floaters, we put it out on raised beds in the shade to sort out anything we don't want, like green unripe cherries, and to take some initial measurements. Coffee fermentation is a science after all, and it's useful to take some key starting metrics to know what we're starting with. This is a maturity table, which is essentially a board with small holes laid out in a 10 by 10 grid, equaling 100 holes. We took a random scoop of cherries and filled each hole with one coffee cherry. The idea is to get a quick glimpse at the quality of the coffee coming in, how many underripe cherries, overripes, and how many perfect cherries there are. Because there are 100 holes, we can get a quick approximation of percentages. This information can tell us two things. What we're starting with, so maybe different incoming coffees get different processes, and also feedback for the farmers and pickers of how much they're getting ripe, underripe, overripe, etc. It's up to you as a producer to decide where your line is. So some people can say, "My, I really want just these three. Like only 30% of my coffee is good for specialty. Some people can say, no, I'm, I'm much more relaxed. I can maybe do, let's say like 60, 60%, I can do, I can have this tolerance. Some people want this really purple. It's just about deciding what is your tolerance, and maybe certain coffees will go toward one profile versus another. Question is, if I had only one tank of this very, very ripe, and one tank of this less ripe, what would be the flavor difference? The answer really depends on what you do next. Not just your starting material, but then what do you do with that starting material? So. If I took this coffee and maybe sanitized it like we were talking about, I took this one and sanitized it, and then inoculated with yeast, they could taste exactly the same. 
that means that our starting material is not so important. So in a way, that is like very um, threatening the specialty, but it can really help a producer. This is all you have, and this, you work with what you got, and so that you're able to sell 80% of your coffee, not just you know the 20%. So it's a tool. The other measurement we took at this point was bricks, which measures the amount of sugar in a liquid. This number can help a producer know how ripe their coffee is, how much sugar is available for the fermentation, and for consistency. Some farmers will use bricks as an absolute measurement and only pick their coffee when it reaches a certain number, or choose which fermentation to do based on the bricks level. For our purposes, we weren't looking for one specific bricks measurement, but that the point was to see how our bricks changes over the course of the fermentation. Specifically, we're looking for the bricks number to go down over time because the fermentation will be eating up that sugar. We sorted the coffee for a while, spread it out thin on the raised beds, and left it overnight. Since this is a yeast inoculated washed coffee, the next step was to remove the skin from the seeds, or to pulp the coffee. This is a deep pulper, which pinches the cherries and removes the seeds, what we call coffee beans, from inside the cherry. Some producers will use water to aid in the pulping. However, since we're going to do a fermentation, we want to preserve as much of the coffee's fruit, called mucilage, as we can. The mucilage is a thin, sticky sugar layer that acts as food for the yeast and bacteria in the fermentation. We did add a little bit of water to the fermentation tank in order to cover the seeds, which allows the fermentation to homogenize throughout the tank. So you'll see the water level is usually right at the top of the coffee. We spent a little time picking out any skins that got through the pulper and moved on to the fun bit. We're using SEMA yeast. Originally from the wine world, this yeast was selected and bred to do well in the conditions of coffee fermentation. It is a tough yeast that works well at many different temperatures, can overcome other yeasts and bacterial competition from the environment, and can be used with many typical coffee varieties. There are many types of commercial yeast available, and this one isn't right for all origins, conditions, varieties, and desired results. It's just the one we're using for this class. Again. Descriptive, not prescriptive. This 500 gram brick is about 45 US dollars and will ferment around 500 kilograms of pulp coffee. That's one gram of yeast per one kilogram of coffee. When you break it down, this translates to around 20 cents per pound added to the cost of production of this coffee. This is really quite expensive for many producers, though it can aid in a more consistent and potentially higher quality coffee as the end result. So it's up to the producer to decide if they have the resources and if they want to use it or not. The yeast in this package are dormant. They're basically sleeping. So our first step in the yeast inoculated fermentation was to wake the yeast up. And this is a really important part. Just like you and me, yeast doesn't like to be woken up quickly or violently. There are certain conditions of ratios, temperatures, and timing we need to create in order for the yeast to wake up without shocking its system. Yeast wakes up when it's hydrated, and we use water at 10 times the weight of the yeast. The yeast is also very temperature sensitive, so we made sure to bring the water to 37 degrees Celsius, which is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Once we had the right amount of water and the correct temperature, we added the yeast to the water. Lucia? I add yeast to water, not the water to the yeast. So just like in baking, you want to add your dry ingredients to your wet. Once Lucia added all the yeast to the water and stirred it around to make sure all the yeast got wet, she put a top on the container to prevent any bugs or other bacteria from disturbing the yeast as it woke up slowly and gently. We set a 20 minute timer at this point because it takes 20 minutes for the yeast to rehydrate and wake up. During this time, you could see it start moving and churning on its own, which was really cool. Once the 20 minutes was up, it was time for the yeast to eat breakfast. Yeast eats sugar, and what's a plentiful source of sugars? That's right, coffee mucilage. So Lucia added a little bit of our depulped coffee to the yeast mixture. This serves two purposes. One, giving the yeast something to eat, and two, lowering the temperature of the yeast. This yeast will be added to our tank of depulped coffee, and just like before, yeast doesn't like big temperature shifts. So we have to get our yeast to within 10 degrees Celsius of the waiting coffee. The coffee tank is sitting at 22 degrees Celsius, 71.6 degrees Fahrenheit at this point, so we want to get below 32 degrees Celsius, or 89.6 Fahrenheit. 
We added a little more of the cold coffee to bring the temperature down further and went over to the bigger tank. We haven't used much water up until this point and we did add a little bit of water to the tank here just to the top of the coffee to ensure a more uniform fermentation as yeast can travel much more easily in liquid than in dry conditions. Now the moment we have all been waiting for. We added the newly awakened yeast to the tank of depulped coffee slowly and stirred the whole time to mix well. And this is why it's called a yeast inoculated coffee because we are introducing yeast and bacteria that we've chosen into a culture medium or the coffee. So we're inoculating the coffee with the yeast, thus yeast inoculated. After that thorough mixing with a clean shovel, we topped the tank with a clean tarp and pushed out any air. With the tarp on, pushed all the way down on top of the coffee, this allows all of the coffee to be submerged, encouraging a more uniform fermentation and it protects the coffee from bugs, dust, critters, or competing bacteria in the environment. After only one hour, the fermentation began to produce bubbles. This is CO2, or carbon dioxide, and it's a byproduct of the yeast and bacteria eating the sugary mucilage. Basically, bubbles are an indication that fermentation is happening and our yeast and bacteria are doing their thing. At this point, we peeled back the tarp and took a few measurements pH, which measures acidity, bricks for that sugar content measurement again, and we took note of the temperature of the fermentation and the ambient temperature. These measurements help us to track the fermentation to make sure it's going in the right direction, and for future fermentations, if everything goes well, we can hopefully replicate it, or if things go poorly and the coffee tastes terrible, we can look back at our data and hopefully find out what went wrong. After these measurements, we put the tart back on like before and left the fermentation to continue its work. After six hours, you can see how much CO2 has been released. This entire bubble is carbon dioxide gas produced by the fermentation, not air that got into the tank. When we peeled back the tarp, the entire tank was bubbling. You could hear it and you could smell the fermentation. If you imagine like fruit that's left out for too long, plus a whiff of bread dough rising, that's what it smelled like. We gave it a good stir to homogenize the fermentation and took more measurements. Again, the pH, bricks, and temperature. Then we covered it back up again. On day two, we checked our fermentation again, and this is 22 hours after we introduced the yeast to the pulped coffee. In this region of Colombia, and in a lot of coffee producing areas, the temperature drops significantly at night, which slows down fermentation but we could tell it was still alive because it was still producing CO2 bubbles. And as a reminder, the thing that is fermenting is the mucilage, the sticky sugar layer that wraps around the coffee seed. At this point in the fermentation, a lot of that mucilage has been broken down and the coffee now sits below the water level. It has also released some more floaters, beans that were heavy with the mucilage, but are now light without that mucilage weighing them down. There are a lot of shells, insect damaged beans, and other defects, and we skimmed them off at this point. Again, we have a good stir and take measurements, the pH, bricks, and temperature. Two hours later, or 24 hours into the fermentation, the ambient temperature has increased and the fermentation was going really strong, as we can see by this big CO2 bubble that appeared in just the last two hours. We knew we were going in the right direction, so we leave the fermentation to do its thing and we wait until day three. Now this is 46 hours into this fermentation. At this point, most of the mucilage has been broken down by the yeast and bacteria, so we can finish the process. First, we take our measurements and we skim the remaining floaters from the tank. Then we give it a good last mix. First two things to notice, how clean it feels like gravel. It's very gravel, it's very dry. And you can take... To me, it smells like, I was gonna say like a fruit cocktail, like um, cantaloupe, green banana, like there's a very banana. fresh. One thing to note is that the fermentation isn't totally done. Like the microbes haven't eaten all the sugars and then died. We can tell this because the fermentation is still bubbling when we stir it. With this method, the point isn't to impart fermented flavors onto the coffee. It's to use the fermentation to remove the mucilage and make the coffee more consistent. So we don't want to wait until the yeast and bacteria have devoured all of the sugar, because that would likely impart over-fermented and probably spoiled flavors into the coffee. And we don't want that. We want a clean, washed coffee. 
So now, after 46 hours of fermentation, we rinse the coffee with clean water and lay it out on raised drying beds in the sunshine to dry. Because our depulper wasn't the best quality and wasn't really calibrated, lots of skins and less than ideal beans got through, so we spent some time hand sorting at this stage as well. But we got all the coffee washed, laid it out in an even layer, and let it sit. It's the next day, day four, and look how beautiful our coffee turned out. It's uniform, it's drying beautifully, and it's looking exactly like a wonderful washed coffee. So that is the process of a yeast inoculated fermentation for a washed coffee. But there's still more to do. This coffee is still in the parchment layer, so once the coffee is fully dry, it'll be dry hulled, which removes that parchment layer and makes it into green coffee. Then it can be roasted, brewed, and enjoyed. Back from the editor's desk to reiterate that this was a descriptive video of what I experienced, not a prescriptive process or a step-by-step -step guide for all coffee everywhere. So please don't take it as such. If you have questions, comments, or ideas, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll do my very best to answer. Also, Lucia has a podcast that's very extensive, very informative, and covers way more than I do in this short video. Check out her podcast, Making Coffee with Lucia Solis, follow her on Instagram, and check out her Patreon. If you like this video, please hit that thumbs up button and make sure to check out my upcoming videos about the citric and lactic process. In fact, just subscribe so you can make sure not to miss those. Thanks for watching. Cheers.